three, two, one. I want to say uh, thanks for coming on the show, Carl Lozer. Well, thank you all for having me. Appreciate it. I'm yeah. excited to be here. How long have uh, we have known each other now? Oh, man. It goes back. Um, two and a half, three years? Yeah, about two, three years, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Something like that, yeah. Well, it's, you've done a lot in two, three years. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've come a long way. And I, I can't say thank you enough, Cal. Seriously. It's, yeah. Um, I, you've very much liberated my mind. I mean, I I feel like when I, was, when, when I first met you, I was probably... A, one of the lowest points of my life, um, close to the one of the lowest points of my life. Um, and that actually hit my lowest point of my life, but it wasn't because of anything like with anything, but with y'all or anything like that. But, um, yeah, it was just, it was just crazy. I came from that and then I just feel like a new person right on top of the world. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like that guy on the, on that, on that nuke, that (laughs) cowboy scene. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Man, so. that's a real te- cow. That's a real testament to your uh, liberating skills. Right. <laughs> yeah, just make but sure you, you know, I'll make sure I rate you well. Oh, on, there we uh, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> one, one drink at a time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> um, I think um, you were introduced to me from a friend, uh, Krista. I guess you guys went to school together. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Out we, in Palatine, Palatine, right? Palatine, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I haven't seen her in a long time. I don't long know time. What, yeah. Uh, and you were. She was telling me like, Cal, I think you might like this guy. Uh, he has a lot of similar beliefs. Uh, he's a libertarian, and I think we became friends through that. And I think yeah. during that time, you were running uh, for office in Palatine. Right? I actually, I think I was getting close to being finished. I think it was like October. It was the middle of your campaign. And, and yeah. yeah, and then I started talking to you, and I was like, well, I'm still open to ideas. You yeah. know, I was always open, um, like pretty much like hearing new things. And yeah. I never really, I mean, I, th- I thought about anarchy because there's like, libertarian anarchists you know like they're still voting and you, still... you, heard, you heard of them oh yeah, yeah absolutely and then also i was like oh yeah i know who those people are and honestly i was pretty much there i yeah. mean i feel like i was like really close to there but there was like some things i was just still not like 100 percent sure of right. and um you know and i talked to you and then i also started diving into like mises since too because i think you recommended me yeah. into mises a little bit and um by the way they have great um, like a great library for like audiobooks and books in general. Great so. wealth of resources. That's yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, just, I just dove in and, you know, it just kind of like, yeah, it was great. It's funny. Like, this is sort of the stuff that uh, I think the Libertarian Party doesn't often do to tell you about arguments towards abolishing the state. I think most of the arguments I kind of put forward kind of gets you close to the finish line. And then at some point, I think that a little bit the Libertarian Party is kind of like a pothole on the way <laughs> to the finish line tonight to know all the arguments about uh, like, what about security? You know, what about law? Uh, these sort of areas to kind of like leave you hanging. They'll bring yeah. you that close, but then they'll, they'll, they'll get you stuck on that, uh, you know, the roads uh, to freedom. Yeah, I, absolutely. Uh, I think I think the biggest thing for me was actually the security, national security part. I was on that loop where I thought, Hey, I need, I need someone to protect me. But like, I also thought I really had to like dive in and think like, well, I never, I don't know these terrorists. I've never done anything to them. Like they're like, they're probably just normal people like me and you just have different beliefs. And they, you know, at the same time, like, yeah, they might be trying to hurt people, but I also don't think like I'm the target. I think the target is more of a political thing than an actual, and they, and they're trying to attack me because of, they think I believe into the same politics as the United States government. So, I think just separating myself from them and realizing that I'm just an individual, they're individuals. What did these Iraqis do to me? Right? Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. I, I never well, talked to one yeah. in my life. I mean, how would you feel, yeah, if uh, somebody came into your, your town and just started uh, pushing people around? And so, you know, you, you kind of give everybody the benefit of the doubt. Why would I, you know, I might react strongly to that same thing too. Yeah, you know? absolutely. I, that would never stand here. That would never, like, if they, if they came over here, do you think any even even the politicians would be like, oh, we're gonna go to war? Same thing. They don't maybe they don't have as well the you know government there. Maybe they have to like develop their own tribes and de- develop their own war type of warfare. They're like, oh, we gotta act because they're not doing enough for us, or they don't feel represented enough to you know go that distance. So I think that's kind of why they you know go that route. They're like, well, we gotta take our own hands. Which you know, I mean, I kind of wish people in America would start taking things in their own hands, not necessarily in the violent way, but just in a way that like, Hey, you know, maybe we should just, you know, start being more individualistic and start, you know, showing people how to, um, you know, be more leaders than just followers, you know, 
and it's and it's just it's just crazy yeah the lp it's weird it's um it really carries a huge breadth of people with it and you got people from like anywhere between just democrat or republican light to uh full-on you know anarchists or whatever and the anarchists are really discouraged by the party leadership and they really don't want them around yeah and uh they and they also just make a point of saying well that's not practical um and uh so they just they they put you in a place where you say well i'm i'm looking for people who are you know i i you you could not possibly continue hanging out with all these people on a regular basis it would just after a while you would just get uh tired of you know beating your head against a brick wall (laughs) yeah and i think just it's super hard to argue for the libertarian party because like a lot of things they they say and go for you know i'm not saying they're not they're they're not trying I, i'm not gonna put put it at that level i know they're trying but I, I think they're going about it the wrong way because i think a lot of people are more logical than they think and i think that they're like trying to tell people like oh believe in this but then like they completely go like and say but then they kind of like are hypocritical on themselves they completely say like yeah we don't believe in government but then like for the most part and then but we do believe in this, so we still gotta force people to do these things. Like we still gotta, f- it's it's completely hypocritical because they're still being aggressive against people who may not believe in them. Like there's a lot of people that are pacifists and you know believe in peace, and they believe in defending, you know, um, defending the country as a whole. I mean, obviously, self defense is always always you know important, and you might have to be a collective in some areas, but. Um, it's always voluntary. You don't need to force people to be a collective. You right. know? I think uh, you're, you're mentioning in terms like they do bring a lot of wide breadth of people in there. And I think that's, uh, they seem to have like a weird open membership. I think one of the membership is you have to uh, follow the non-aggression principle. Right. right. Yeah. But then they bring in people who kind of advocate for, uh, I think, minimum wage. You have your libertarian caucus people. Um, oh, like the socialists. The socialists. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 socialist, caucus. the yeah, libertarian yeah. socialists. I'm <laughs> like, so, what? They don't have their in there that says, you know, that uh, we're a pro-capitalist group. This is, uh, we respect property rights. Uh, but, you know, because that's not defined, now you allow a group of people that could turn the party into something else, right? Co-opt it from the inside. Um, and in terms of co-opting from the inside, I think some of, a lot of the libertarian platforms are good platforms that they have. Uh, but the thing is, if, uh, if they ever got famous or if there were any of these platforms were very popular, uh, what do you think the other parties will do? They'll just co-opt them. Co-opt them. Right. And, yeah. Or the universal basic income. They talk about that a lot. Yeah. And uh, they'll say, well, this is a libertarian solution, uh, right? Because it'll eliminate all these programs. And, you know, when you look at it from a moral perspective, ultimately, anarchists usually get to that point where they say, no, it's immoral, ultimately. And that's why it's, you know, I can't, I can't justify uh, force even if you're saying I'm going to get something good out of it, right? Right. And uh, so that, that's where they, they go wrong, and I think they're going to be talking about that at the uh, Liberty Con. Liberty Con. Who's the DC. chief editor of uh, Reason? Uh, he wears the black jacket. Matt Welch or um, no, the other the, his name. The guy with the slick hair. Yeah, I, I, I <laughs> forgot his name. Anyway, so they're, for the most part, it's oft, oftentimes they can't even say the taxation is theft. Uh, and you'll find like some of these. Uh, <sighs> that's crazy. Yeah, you'll find like some of these videos up there with uh, um, that they'll say like you know they'll, they'll point out all these other areas like the government involvement is Nick Gillespie. Yeah, Nick Gillespie. Oh, He's yeah, going to be yeah. there again, so we're going to have another round three. <laughs> yeah. Last time I was I was uh, talking to him, he was really drunk, and you can tell in, in our conversation um, it was kind of aggressive because he was like kind of weirded out, but kind of cool that you know we're doing this again. Because uh, last time I was asking him to define like what is capitalism, it's like respect for property rights, you know. So we we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that, and I said, well, it came down to the point like that, like what do you think taxation is? And then so he couldn't. He tried to find another way of trying to say that it's not theft. It's like, well, you know, it's not consensual. And the first couple of questions I asked you, if you advocate for property rights, do you think it's wrong, to, you know, to take that away if it's uh, more in that direction? And he would uh, not want to continue the conversation. I usually talk to these people to a point where drive them down until yeah, they walk yeah, away yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. well because they realize there's no way of yeah you know feeling actually they know what the right answer is but they won't actually ever admit it because it goes against what they're making money they're making right. money they're making money off of yeah it. yeah um so it's like 
what what is what's their tag like free markets free minds just like limited minds right. limited markets they're yeah. funded by the Koch brothers too which so it's very you know they're they're t- towing this line that's right yeah yeah, and yeah it's difficult they can't they can't just say no get rid of it all you right know? and have a weird stance on immigration too uh we're gonna do a whole show on immigration too it's a hot topic oh Borders great yeah because yeah. Yeah. i think their platform is open borders and just let anybody in um in which uh, there's contention in the anarchist community towards that. Yeah, I I, I really can't wait for that show. Yeah, honestly, because yeah, yeah. because you have a really interesting opinion. I I, I don't know if I 100% agree with it, but I I, I value it. Right, I, right. I do. So, uh, so how did I you come across uh, the Libertarian Party? What was there like? What what brought you? Actually, um, a close a close friend of mine was a big Libertarian, and he got me into it. Bo? Um, no, oh. no, actually, I mean. I love Bo, but uh, just from you know being a pr- on a personal level, he's yeah. great. Um, I don't know if I stand for all of his policies, but he's you know he's definitely a great guy and taught me a lot. But um, my friend Winston actually, hmm. um, yeah, he's he's actually not he's actually a complete anarchist now. He he just completely separates himself from the world. It's pretty cool. <laughs> um, no, like he just like he's like I don't vote, I don't do anything. He's like I'm I'm done with this crap. I'm on my own business. Yeah, I'm on my own <laughs> business. I'm doing my thing. Like that's and that's what he does. And I'm like. I value that 100. percent I mean, well, what, what, um, how did you? Meet he told him? me he's like, I'm. He's like, you're the last person I'm voting for because like I'm done. Like I, I don't ever want to vote again. And I'm was like, he a friend like in high, high school? In high or, school, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I met him in high school. Yeah, we've just been friends since. So, what, how did he get into it? Uh, you know, I think he just. I think he was just big into Ron Paul. Yeah, hmm. um, and he kind of got me following Ron Paul. I was really at the end of the Ron Paul era, but I, I still valued Ron Paul, mm-hmm. and then. I was always actually kind of liberal, and then I started going to I, yeah, it's really weird. When I went liberal to Republican, I mean, from so Democrat, I, so I was like, yeah, I'm kind of a Democrat. This is in high school, obviously. Yeah, and I, so I guess I really wasn't ever a Democrat, but I, I was very liberal leaning. And then um, I started like talking, well, you know, I I am kind of conservative when it comes to capitalistic policies. And he's like, well, he's like, you might be more libertarian because you know. It is kind of like the liberal side of things, but then I never actually knew the no government side of it or the limited government side of it. And, and then he started telling me like, well, you know, it's limited government. It's not necessarily, you need this stuff. And then I started, um, while I was in the Republican party, like while I was being there, I was like, cause I was active in Palatine a little bit. And I started realizing like, you know what? I kind of don't believe everything they believe in either. And I was trying to find my spot and I just, down to the libertarians and like, yeah, I believe this. And a lot of them were basically straight. Like most of them were actually basically anarchists. They just voted. Um, there were some that weren't, um, but yeah, like I, I mean, I still don't agree with voting or anything like that, but um, when it comes to, I just remember this one, this one, uh, when I was running for office, this one wonky, um, probably the wonky gazette or something like that. Some kind of like, um, what's the, what's it called? I can't the think Wonkette. of it. The, the Wonkette. Yeah. The Wonkette. Um, Isn't that a DC blog or something? Yeah. It's a, yeah. The Wonkette. They asked me like, do you believe in, uh, sp- speed limits? And I was like, it's not necessary. You know, it's not necessary at all because people regulate themselves. You know, when, when, you know, it's raining, people naturally drive slower. Like you can't go right. faster. You can't go faster than the person in front of you. I mean, you're going to, you know, and like, well, what about the what about the school, school zone? And you know, I'm like, well, you know, like, you hit a kid, like you killed someone. You're That's, responsible for that. Yeah, you're responsible for that. So like, there's there's like like there's already and, and if you want to play the law argument, there's laws for killing people. Like, right. so like if you kill someone, like they already made it illegal, I mean, so there shouldn't be any killing. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, you kill someone, you know, with a car, it's the same thing. You're right. killing someone, like no doubt. So they will say like. um like you could say a testament that most people are peaceful. Yeah. Or like here, for example, would be like they drive these uh, combustible machines that um, have like the impact of like several TNTs than what they're carrying in these big, huge vehicles. They're not horse carriages anymore where you can kind of slow down or anything like that. Right. You can go like super fast in those cars uh, to the point like wrong, wrong turn. You can just crash into a tree and not to say like this happened. I think uh, highway deaths are like around 30 something thousand a year. Which you could say is the fault of the government because they have bad, shitty roads, right? Yeah, yeah. Like if I go on a roller coaster and it goes off, you don't blame the person riding any. You blame like the tracks, right? Yeah. The people who who you know make claim for that. Um, but you could say that 
since that's not really happening, people are not really running all into each other all the time. So like, it's not it's not that bad at all, actually. It's a function of uh, city planning and and architectural design of the way that these uh, large communities are created and designed. And it seems like the current format is one in which we have central government, and that's where the funds come out of, and this is where they get poured into. And we got to make sure we have this large highway thoroughfare leading into that area, um, and everyone relies on the government to create that, you know, these roads and in between certain places. But if you didn't have the government, there might be other ways. And also another good, interesting thing about that, I think is uh, if you ever buy a house or you live in a community and everybody knows where you are and they, they know what your car looks like and you drive through there and I can't help but think every time I drive through my neighborhood, I better not speed because like people aren't going to like me very much if right. I'm just blasting through here every day and they get to see who I am. And right. So there's a certain level of, uh, you know, um, reputation, reputation. Exactly. Yeah. I like the signs that people have like drive as if your kids live here, your children live here. Yeah. Right. So those get me too. Cause I, I like to speed. Uh, I, I drive through stoplights, stop sure. signs all the time. Um, I probably break like at least traffic, 10 traffic laws every day. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Well, <laughs> when you add it up, it's like it takes a lot of time off your time. You know, it's like I'm a capable driver. Um, I have a situational there's no, there's awareness. There's no cars coming. There's no cars coming, right? I'm I'm good to go. Um, left turn, left turn, red arrows. Right. You know, I, I slow down when I see every time. Yeah, I, I, I slow down when I see people kind of crossing or coming to my path. You know, um, I, I have a good sense of, like I said, of regulation. I don't want to mess up my car, right? Um, <laughs> You know, it's crazy. I feel like most people like are just like, let me just make sure I'm not doing anything wrong so the cops don't get me. You know? Right. <laughs> yeah. There's places now in Europe, I almost forgot about this, that they've removed all the traffic lights. They've removed traffic signs, everything. And then they've also removed sidewalks. So it's a shared road experience where you have with pedestrians and cyclists and people driving cars. And they find that the uh, accidents drop down immediately. Because now when you're driving, you're not driving looking for lights because that's the only kind of contact you have right you have your peripheral stuff but you know you're really just looking for lights you know green means go fast yellow means go even faster red you know maybe coast it and uh put your brakes on it while you're you know going across the intersection to make it look like you're braking but that's all they're paying attention to where when you remove these kinds of distractions do you have now a situational awareness where you kind of make eye contact with one another and see where things are so not only and you would think well does this uh, with this increase the time of traffic, it actually drops the time of traffic. People wow. actually drive faster, get to their places. Um, like one woman was very skeptical. They did an interview with her before and after. It's like, yeah, this is not going to work. Mm. They interviewed her later. It's like, I saved 20 minutes <laughs> going home from work. <laughs> so um, they find that maybe this kind of like state control of social engineering uh, doesn't work. And there's like this organic reach, especially like communities like that like like they know each other that would create more of a sense of knowing each other that would make a sense like well you just made eye contact with me yeah. there's a recognition there um and you find that this experiment is now spreading to a lot of other cities in europe where it's, it's working yeah yeah it's very reputation based it seems like right uh and you'll find otherwise here is this this cash grab because i've noticed around uh some cities where like it's 65 and then they put one little sign over here you know it technically is there it drops down to like 50 but as soon as you go over the corner the cop can pull you over like did you know you're going you know over the speed limit you know 15 uh, 10 miles over that's uh what is it 10 or 20 in which it's reckless so, driving 20 reckless. Virginia, yeah. yeah 20 yeah and most people drive like 5 10 miles over speed limit anyways right and that's like the safe buffer zone or 80 or, or 80 yeah, yeah don't go over 80 um which word of advice for well i probably shouldn't say advice but in virginia do not go 20 over the speed limit yeah because you can actually, it's a jailable jail. offense. It's a jailable offense in Virginia, and most travelers outside the state, they they go over, right. they go over eighty, and then they have to go to court. Like I've seen, I've actually seen a guy just straight like admit, like, yeah, I'm so sorry, I was going, you know, that speed over, and he's like, I'll just pay the fine, and they're like, oh no, 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 you need a, an attorney to represent you, because uh, yeah. because we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna <laughs> you know it's a jailable offense, like you could go to jail. What uh drove you to? run for the libertarian party like like i mean sir you're you have your interest in like the democrat republican and then i guess you have like this sense of like righteousness like well you know this this is right i can't like pretend it doesn't exist uh and now you feel like you have to do something about it where, where so, did that come from so you know it's funny like i um i knew i knew 
I knew actually uh, when I was going for it, I knew I probably wasn't going to win. I mean, I was like, I had that idea in my mind. Like I had that high ego that I thought maybe, yeah, I could win. But then I also knew go, my first originally went, I'm like, I'm not going to win. But if I can get as much attention and bring in much pe- and more people into the party, you know, that was my idea. Like, I'm like, cause I think, I think bringing people in is like kind of the, I thought the originally was the way, Hey, I can help people learn about it because right. I, I thought the reason people weren't in it is because they just didn't know. Right. And I think this still is a lot of the reason, but I also think the libertarian party, um, you know, I think, I think they're leading them, misleading them. They, they're not doing things the correct way to make it seem like it's a party of weed cannabis, you know? <laughs> Oh yeah, um, gay marriage, weed, and prostitution. There we go. Yeah, okay. yeah. those are the triumvirates. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> and, and weed and gay marriage have all been already and been guns right. and, and guns yeah. right. and guns. Um, so yeah, I, I think uh, I think like I don't I don't know if I like the tagline that they put themselves out there that says you know we're socially liberal, uh, fiscally oh. conservative, as if to say like the libertarian don't have uh, their own culture they can kind of put out as if like they're drawing from two different places. And not kind of making themselves uh, as an original, unique position. They're, they're trying to bridge themselves, like, "Hey, Republicans, come to us." It's like they're trying hey, to compromise, Democrats, right? Come to us, yeah. Instead and, of having like their own identity. And if they, and I think, I think they would do. Be- I actually do think they would do a lot better if they did have their own identity, right. because we've been try- Like, I remember when I was a libertarian, like we would try to like basically pull people from the other parties, and I'm like, there's so many people that didn't vote. Actually, there's more people that don't vote than there there right. are that do. But anyways, that besides the point. I'm like, why don't I was thinking like, why don't we try to get some of those people like that don't vote to like come out and vote? You know, at the time I didn't yeah, 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 know yeah, better, yeah. but at the same time I was like, why not try to get those people? Because like clearly, either they don't have an opinion, or you know, they 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 know like, hey, I really don't want government in my life, so I'm just gonna kind of zone it out. So I was like, man, those are probably the best people to get because you can get a really good following, but right. at the same time. The mess, like I said, the message is not is not is not right. Like, right. It's just not a right message right now. I think you did a really good uh, job in uh, pulling people's attention at one point uh, with a <laughs> photograph that was kind of circulating around. They kind of did combine the triumphant we were talking about. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So can you tell me how that that idea came to be? Yeah, actually. Um, so just so the followers know, um, basically it was a picture of of me. In my bedroom, <laughs> with a, it was a friend, and uh, she was topless on top of me. It looked like we were having sex, and I had she had a bowl in her hand. I had a gun in my other in my hand, and um, basically, yeah, it was it was just it, like I put I posted it as a victory, like yeah, you know, like I knew I wasn't gonna win, but I was just like, you know what. Hey, it was a great campaign. Well, the, the spotlight's on you right yeah, now. Yeah, <laughs> the spotlight's on me. Like, this is my last day. I'm just going to, you know, give it my all. And, and you know, um, it hit, like, I think it hit, like, over 10, 12,000 views, like, within, like, within the night. And then, of course, I was living with my parents at the time. So it was just kind of like, hey, they wanted me to take it down, yeah. which, I, which I understand, too. <laughs> I understand from their yeah. perspective. Like, That's our house. But yeah, 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 exactly. Like That's our bed. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah ex- exactly. I know that girl. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so she wasn't a real prostitute then. No, no. Okay. It looked like so it looked like yeah, so it looked like a prostitute. Okay. Like, you know, some people like thought yeah, I thought it was like in a hotel room or something. Like oh that. no, yeah. no, no. Yeah. yeah. It, was, it was in my actual house and yeah. So it was pristine. Yeah. <laughs> I it was it, it honestly I, I really do think it made a really good point. Like, hey, it's my bedroom. Not in my bedroom. Like, right, it goes back like, to it's, it's not your business. Not your business. Right. Exactly. I think that's kind of like uh, what Benjamin Franklin was actually was trying to say, like the motto of the U.S. would be at one point. He had like this coin saying, uh, mind your own business. I believe that's what was the phrase. Sure. Does that sound familiar? Have you heard of this? No. I, no. Yeah. I, I've heard something like that, but I don't, I don't know exactly the quote or anything. I think everybody has a starting point that that type of thing sounds uh, th- is attractive, though. It's like... We, look, we all go about our daily lives, and with it, we don't really have to interact with the government that often. You know, your buddy smokes weed. You know that's fine. You know, it's it's like it's not ruining his life. The government doesn't need to regulate that. And yeah. So it's a good starting point for a lot of people. I, I, I mean, are they, when are they, when they're going to start regulating that we eat broccoli every day? When right. are they going to start regulating like right. like when when is the point that people say stop it? And and, and we still haven't found that point, unfortunately. Yeah. You think, and, and I would say Benjamin Franklin will have your side with that because I would say that was his 
this cane is on display in uh, Philadelphia. I, I acknowledge it as his pimp cane because it was very popular <laughs> with the ladies, <laughs> extremely yeah. popular with the ladies, especially overseas in Paris. And I was doing his like uh, ambassadorship. Um, and <laughs> the funny thing about him is, uh, so he, the, it's called the Fusio Cent. It's the first official one cent piece of the United States currency consisting of 0.36 ounce of copper. And it was inspired by Benjamin Franklin. And on it, it says, mind your business. <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, I haven't heard of that. That's hmm. pretty cool. Um, weird thing about him, though, I think he might be uh, America's first serial killer because underneath his house, they found, like, recently, it's a couple years ago, like, troves of, like, dead bodies, uh, what? skeleton remains, no things like that. No way. Right? That's so cool. I mean, he was, I mean, he, he's a mad scientist. Yeah, right? I mean, he's <laughs> yeah. a mad scientist. You know, he's got his kid, I think, holding a key uh, out in the wind during a lightning storm or something like that, right? Uh, huh. Is that how he killed the kids? Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's how it started. He was the first John Wayne Gacy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. This is safe. I'll go fly that kite. No, it's a scientific experiment. <laughs> it's totally safe. Zap. <laughs> You'll get paid, I promise. It's the You're perfect dead. crime. Oh. Really. Yeah, it's the perfect crime, right? I mean, he knew about DNA evidence even then. So some people are saying, no, he was just ex- curious about cadavers and dead bodies, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've seen this movie. That's, not, that's usually the government cover-up since they plaster his face over the world. It's kind of like, um, have you seen the movie... Uh, have you seen uh, the TV show Serenity, Firefly? I, I, I think I saw an episode. Well, of it's it. like this scene where like this guy comes back to a town and everyone like, he, he doesn't know why everyone's cheering for him or sees him as a celebration, uh, like a heroic figure. Hmm. And then he remembers that at one point he went to that town to rob some money and had a problem with the... So he robbed the town and had a problem with the people he was robbing uh, with in which like he threw the money off. It, it, it fell off somewhere. So he just started raining money in the city and people like attribute like him being like this very philanthropic uh, heroic person that like stole from the rich and gave to the poor sort of thing. But he never intended that to happen. So I think this could be like the same sort of kind of cover up for Benjamin Franklin. Like, mm-hmm. well, we want to we want to remember him for who he was and who we need him to be and not sure. for what he really accomplished. Uh, I think it's like a Sounds runner. like Christopher Columbus or something. Right, know. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I think they did the same thing in, uh, in a Rick and Morty episode. Um, some kind of mayor. You guys watch Rick and Morty? Right. Yeah, yeah. It's a show Absolutely. of intellectuals. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Love Rick and Morty. Sounds like, please don't call me out. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, yes, I do watch that show. It's a cartoon. <laughs> it's I mean, a documentary. All <laughs> listeners should be, well, I say should, but... Obviously, at your own discretion, but definitely check out Rick and Morty. It's, so you, you got involved show. in the, the Libertarian Party, and but at the same time, along that time, you were doing like legal work. Yeah. What kind of legal work were you doing? So I was doing like civil lit- litigation, and um, yeah, I was doing mostly like uh, traffic accident cases. Um, we, yeah, we did a lot of stuff like that. So. So you, you determine like whether or not they're at fault or the insurance company. Yeah, has to we pay. were we were suing for the most part. Um, I was working for an attorney that sued um, that sued insurance agencies mm-hmm. uh, for for the, ideally the pro- the proper you know to make them to make their clients whole again, like right. as you know whole people. And um, yeah, so that's that's kind of what I did for a while. But actually, um, so you I, have to convince like the jury. Yes, right, you have yeah. to com- well, yeah. Depending if you have a jury trial or not, you kind of choose um, certain. And then, like, it's always like, well, this judge is good. Oh, oh, we gotta stick with this one, or we don't like this judge, but Richmond has a really good jury, so therefore we'll go to Richmond and we'll right. have a good jury. So you paint the uh, the victim as like this very, you know, yeah, uh, you know, this oppressive, innocent person, innocent person. Yeah, 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 down on their luck, you know, like. Yeah. Come on, it's a corporation. They can afford to lose that money. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Well, it's funny. Um, in Virginia, you can't say the word insurance. Um, oh, really? In, in the courtroom, yeah. Huh. It's, it's not. It's like a. It's a rule. For, it's a court. It's a court rule. Um, Weird. Yeah, you can't. I say hear like ins- you can't even say you can't even instruct a jury that there's you can't tell them about jury nullification. Oh no! Right? No. Yeah. It's funny though. Actually, at the time, I I brought um, I brought my my attorney a jury for, a jury nullification uh pamphlet from i think it was from cop block mm-hmm. at the time hmm. um yeah uh and basically yeah he was like yeah this is totally legal i'm like yeah he was, he was just like he's like i got he's like do you mind if i keep this i want to show my buddies and i'm like 
Yeah. Right. Like have, you know, have fun. You can't inform jurors of their full capacity of rights. No. Yeah. No. Uh, you brought this up in the group. About right. People so jury nullification to... being the ability of the jury to say, we disagree with the law, not necessarily whether this person is guilty of it or not, but we think find the, the law itself immoral. Right. Right. And uh, I did jury duty. We're going to do it. Actually, that would be a good topic to do as well. But when I did it, though, and they're giving us the entire instruction, like everything about jury duty, all this sort of stuff you have to do, I'm in there with a room of maybe 30 people. And so I brought up, like, hey, nowhere in here do I see anything about jury notification. Don't you think that's kind of important for us to kind of know? And she's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, this, is, this is before the lawyers come in. Oh. Right. So, so, uh, send them to the guillotine. Right, right. <laughs> and then she said, she was like, she didn't even know what that was. She's like, wow. what, what is it? Like, what is that? And it's like, all right, well. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so, so, yeah, oh. yeah, so, so I explained it. It's like, huh, I never heard of that. So, yeah, I'm weird. And so when we did the whole process, I made sure I was on the jury because I thought it was going to be a criminal case. And that's the thing that I forgot because you hear yeah. all this time about, yeah, you want to be in the jury because you can say right. not guilty you know, to a victim's crime. But then I got involved in a civil litigation case. And I was so like, there was a victim. <laughs> 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 well, techni- sorry, so technically in a free market, right, there should not be any difference between uh, civil and criminal because yep, right. they're all the same... Uh, violation of property rights. Yeah. The state makes a distinction between that for some reason, arbitrary reason, but the issue, that shouldn't be the case. Right. Yeah. Um, so I would say uh, that's a weird thing that the state has done, but when I was uh, involved with this, it was it was an insurance thing. Yeah. yeah I actually want to comment on that. I think um, it's kind of funny. In Well, I'm not sure. It's just in Virginia. But basically, most places don't actually, for, for, crimi- for criminal... Um, for criminal for criminal cases they don't do jury duty and the reason is i mean they don't they don't do a lot of jury duty doesn't happen for criminal cases and it's because um when you're a juror they say that the jurors will actually say the max death penalty like they say oh this is the minimum this is the maximum and most of the time they'll give them or they'll give the death penalty or they'll give or they'll give like the maximum punishment for a crime even if it's not worth the maximum punishment when a judge Knowing the law better and knowing what's a reasonable decision will most likely say, well, they kind of did this once or they did this, this is the first time they did it. So we're going to give them not the minimum or the maximum. We're kind of do maybe like the closer to minimum, like maybe like two years or something like that, you know, mm-hmm. rather than like a jury saying like, oh, yeah, we, we think he's guilty. So he should get the full penalty. So we'll give him the maximum crime. So that's why a lot that's why a lot of lawyers will say. No, we don't want a jury trial because the the crim in the criminal law they'll they'll the the jurors can basically say yeah max they don't tell them do they recommend it or they recommend the max <clears throat> okay always and, and like, the judge can can well, the judge have any discretion or they they try to recommend both like this is the minimum this is the maximum like do what you think and most time apparently jurors uh, jurors usually choose the max because they're like yeah he did it this is what he deserves right like and it's like I guess they're just led I mean to say I'm sure. You know, tweaks it so it like looks that way. Right. So yeah. Sometimes the uh, so it's just, it's just like one juror that keeps him from getting the death penalty. They'll say no. Yeah. No, I, don't, yeah. I don't agree to that. And so then it's not a unanimous recommendation. <sighs> yeah. I mean, it's it's the pe- it's the it's the people that you know aren't group thinking or aren't like you know, man, like they the and you know it's it's good to be that person sometimes. Like, you know, hey, well, actually, I think it's good to be that person a lot of the time, but. You know, especially like in times like that, it is it is tough to stand up against a crowd, and you know, in times where someone's going to receive death penalty over something that isn't worth the death penalty, you should definitely stand up. It's it's the it's, way to the way to stand up would be because uh, you're given a position when you're in jury, and that I was given this position. Yeah, that you need someone to be uh, the leader. The leader. Yeah. yeah. So you have to pick someone. The foreman, right? Yeah. That's, or yeah. like uh, the Vikings would say, like uh, the legal speaker or something like that. Um, and so I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing that. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, take, so take the position. Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. Take, take it. Cause no one's going to say object to that. Uh, nobody knows what they're doing. Nobody they don't want to do it. They don't yeah, want to do it. They, no they already feel before, uncomfortable right. being there. Just go in there and say, Hey, the, I'm going to go ahead and do it. And then just take the lead and just kind of take charge of that. Yeah. Um, and sometimes we had, we were sent off into the back to do, because they had to deliberate and do something which we couldn't hear. And we're not allowed to talk to, about the case, so I just talk about anarchy. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> so the funny thing is, when we 
I, I thought the person deserved some money. Uh, and I convinced everyone otherwise. It was it was a fun fun case. Yeah. Because um, it was like almost down. I made my case, and then uh, people changed their mind, and they eventually went down. Like, yeah, okay, he's right. But we made our deliberation, in which like she's not owed like so much money, like a certain amount, say like maybe six thousand. Yeah. I mean, we went back to the judge, and the judge like, well, I need you guys to go back and you know and reconsider uh, strongly, maybe to include like maybe her lawyering and stuff like that. And so, like, all right, we, we put a little bit back in there. But, yeah, like you're mentioning, like, they have a yeah, weird way of most, trying to... Most lawyers are 33% of your, you know, right. so wow. at their, yeah, like, as a jury, you should at least add 33% on top of that because he's going to the attorney. And so it's like, it sucks because, like, you're not even made whole as a client, you know? Like, you're supposed to be made whole, but, right. you know, a lot of times it's not, that's not the case. So what do you think about the whole legal system altogether then? It... it it's it's all a front. That's the way I see it. It's just let's try to do the political thing. Let's try to do the right thing and make people feel like they are getting what they want or like we're doing something. And it's just you know it. They do the run through. They say you know criminal cases is just basically you know you have the, oh let me appoint an attorney for you so you could um, you know you could basically we'll represent you better and. Those those appointed attorneys are just like, yeah, I'm gonna fill in. I'm getting paid this little money. I don't care. Um, I'm just gonna tell you the same thing I tell every client. Um, yeah, I'm gonna make sure I do the. I'm gonna work really hard to negotiate with that prosecutor for you. But believe me, I promise I'm gonna do that. And then they never look at your file. And then that day, like, oh, I just looked at your file. You don't have this stuff. We're gonna have to negotiate less. And then it's just like, we're like they keep negotiating down less and less for you. And like. Well, no, you can combat that. And, you know, and so a lot, a lot of these prosecutors literally are just not prosecutors. These appointed attorney, these, uh, uh, attorneys that are appointed for you are just basically taking the money and like, Oh yeah, I'm here for this person. And they just look at the folder. Yeah. I just reviewed these today. They look horrible. Like, sorry, uh, let's negotiate a plea deal. Mm -hmm. And like, you definitely should plea. Always plea. Hey, if I, if I'm an attorney, I'm going to tell you to plea because, you know, you definitely know the outcome. You definitely know this outcome, and this is definitely what you're going to get. It's a, it's a really high risk, and it's against my ethics to make you have the possibility to get, be, you know, to be free or to be, you know, like you know this outcome. You don't know the other outcome. You could, you could lose. You most likely will lose. When really they don't know, the, they don't know if you lose or not. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, and if you are innocent, I mean, I honestly suggest like looking into it for yourself doing your own research you know trying to find the best what best outcome the you know it, everybody watches these documentaries on netflix like the staircase and making a murderer and they talk about th these guys in these documentaries have money to spend on their defense so it's amazing what they can come out with they they've, they have uh, experts and investigators on their team and they they're researching uh, various alternative scenarios to the to the murder and what have you and and it's so interesting because the typical person doesn't have that you know they have a public defender <laughs> yeah yeah and i also think about the amount of money that the state spends to convict these people it almost seems completely unfair compared to the, the amount of money that the defendant has to right. defend themselves. It's totally lopsided. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Especially when the uh, prosecutor is buddy buddy with the judge. They want to make, you know, we have a lot of cases on the docket. We got to get through it. So I know how you're going to go, you know, how I'm going to go. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, like the state, uh, the, the defender they, they give you, uh, mm -hmm. they know how the whole thing would work to make it go smoother and faster. And then so they already have it rigged against you all right so you can't really say it's kind of fair and impartial uh when they all kind of work for the same team yeah you, right. you know fair and meaningful trial but then yet you get the you get the 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 um prosecutors witnesses up right next to the judge you know like if you ever noticed that like most people don't even realize like how come your witnesses have to go behind the bar or the you know the big bench the, the big uh wall in front of the thing but their witnesses get upfront treatment why is that Right, you know, like that—that's just something people don't realize. But that's that's supposed to be fair and meaningful. Or the prosecutor can walk in the back room of the courthouse. Why is that? Like, how can they walk back there? Right. Why, it, why, why can't you have uh, the innocent party, right? The accused, sit right next to the jury. Yeah. Exactly. Right? Yeah. 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 And you can't. It's just—it's just one of those things. All right. Um, 
Yeah, I think the whole thing's kind of set up. Yeah, to make you feel. Um, it's an illusion. That's all it is. So you were doing this uh, courtroom stuff for how long now? Um, I I did it for about three years, three three and a half years or so. Um, yeah, I just decided to get out of it. And then you got into writing a book. Yeah. Apparently. Yeah, yeah. What's it called? Um, it's called Becoming the Hodler, the Ultimate Cryptocurrency Investor. Yeah, it's um, it was great. I um, you know, I got motivated because I realized that a lot of people that are in the cryptocurrency space are we're basically like, hey, I want money now. I want to win. I don't care. I don't know what I'm investing in, and they didn't really have the proper mindset into getting into what they were investing in. And so I think the whole idea of writing the book was basically teach people about the mindset and teach people like what they need to be a good investor and understand what they're investing in. And I think that, that the whole aspect of the um, crypto cryptocurrency world is is missing. I would say it did bring in a lot of people, I think for the first time took into investing, uh, but not knowing like uh, the ins and out or the roller coaster ride that was going to be placed in front of you. Yeah. Uh, reading your book kind of, I think highlights the entire experience. Sure. So the person doesn't have to kind of fall into the pitfall of like, what do I do now? Do I panic? sell? Yeah. Uh, what's, what's anyone else is doing. <laughs> yeah. um, and I think you do a good job in the book. Uh, um, exp- expressing what you went through yeah. and in a way kind of to help others to kind of prevent that and to have a good idea or a philosophy uh of hold, how would you say it holding hodling Hoddle, hodling. I, hodling i call it hodling some people say hodling i think it's just like you know tomato tomato it's one of those things i i thought it was uh the name came from the game of thrones character holder <laughs> uh <laughs> Hold the door, uh, <laughs> hold your cryptos, right? right. Don't sell. <laughs> this is you from the future telling yourself. Right. <laughs> and that's how you know it's a good investment. All right. Yeah. Uh, so where, where does the name uh, hodler, 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 hodler come from? Yeah, it actually um, comes from the word, well, comes from the acronym HODL, which was made mistakenly at um, a Bitcoin t- talk post. Um it's basically a blog on the internet. Some some guy was drunk one night. It was basically like I lo- it was like I think it was like 2013. He's like I'm losing everything. My wife <laughs> my wife my wife abandoned me. Is oh, that no. lesbian bar and like a bunch of stuff. And then he's just like, but you know what? I'm still I'm still hodling. And he sp- he misspelled. Well, so we think he misspelled holding, and he's like he's still holding Bitcoin. And basically, people were like later on were like, what is hodling well, what is hodl you know and basically someone's like well, what is hodl and it means hold on for dear life like that's what it was another post i think it was on reddit and hold on for dear life is kind of like yeah when times get rough like stick to your guns you know be strong in what you believe in and i think i think a lot of people people that will enter the, crypt- the cryptocurrency space or crypto asset space as i like to call it i think they realize that that they don't really know what they're, they don't really have any belief in it. They just wanted quick money and they didn't, you know, they didn't really research what they're investing in. They didn't, you know, they didn't understand what they're investing in. It was like, Hey, you can make a quick buck, you know, like let's go to, let's, let's buy BitConnect or, you know, something like that, you know, like BitConnect. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was, <laughs> yeah. Like, Oh man, I can make a quick buck, you know, make do something, buying BitConnect, you know, like, <laughs> And so, like, people were, and people did make money on it, but at the same time, like, there's nothing to it. It was, it was like, BitConnect itself was a, bon- a Ponzi scheme. And then it was a meme coin. Yeah. Yeah. It was a meme coin. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, honestly, it's it's actually hilarious to look at now. <laughs> I mean, it's it's hilarious. But how does that uh, video go? It's like, I got to tell you something. Uh, <laughs> uh, it kind of made me so rich. You know, the funny thing about this video that they put out there, that they had these. Um, looks like they paid actors just to go behind him and just kind of nod while this guy's kind of delivering this speech on stage. But the camera keeping it on him as he's talking about Big Connect and how like awesome it is. And he's like rich Um, (laughs) and like never pans to the audience. Uh, So it kind of cuts short and it stops right there. So I'm thinking the theory is there is never anyone there in the audience. They just rented a room, a stage, and just kind of did this Green promo screen. video. Yeah, <laughs> fake it till you make it. Fake yeah. it till you make it. Yeah, That's what you do, baby. 
so <laughs> how would you say then uh, Bitcoin, uh, I mean, it changed your life. Yeah. Right? You wrote yeah, a book yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, my first my first eighteen dollar investment. My friend got me in and just you know basically uh, taught me some of the some some of the, some of the things behind it. And then after that, I was still not like fully there, but like because because like it's a lot to take in at once. Yeah. You know, I, I think for most people, for most investors, like people are still like you can tell them once and they're like, uh, okay, I sort of get the idea. It's you know free money. Like like no, sorry, I shouldn't say free money. It's the freedom of you know holding your own money or being in control of your money. No one controlling your money. You know, because it's in the banks right now, pretty much you could say. Yeah, yeah, the, like the Federal Reserve, they you know they 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 control our they inflate your money every day. People don't even realize they're getting taxed every single day by holding on cash. You know, mm-hmm. you know, like all they do is start inflating your money, and you know that one dollar that was worth one dollar, you know, is now worth seventy five cents. You know, over time, you know, or or so I shouldn't say seventy five cents. I should say. 98 cents you know it's like they're slowly right. putting more in circulation to make your money worth less and meanwhile the bitcoin it's a definite supply you know i mean and it's pro- it is right now progressively inflating but the inflation rate is getting lower over time what they call it the happening or is that what it's called yeah but it's 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 stated you know it's yeah. built into it it's and everybody in. knows what it is right Exactly. So, I mean, if if you can, if you know, if you when you look into cryptocurrency or crypto assets, you can really look and see, you know, what benefits you the best. And there's there's more than just currencies out there. There's, you know, I'm hoping one day. Um, I, I think I, I think I talked about it in my. Um, I think you talked about talked with me about it in my book. Um, I wrote inside of my cover that there's a proof of existence coin, or that I'm really hoping for to come out. Um, which means that like, basically we don't need government to copyright our stuff. You know, we don't need any, you know, agency copyright our stuff. We just need some, you know, a technology out there to basically say, Hey, I did it first. Like this is, I'm time stamping this, you know, like, please don't take my work. I don't care if you use my work or, you know, try to make, you know, further it. But at the same time, like, I don't, I want credit for what I did. You mm-hmm. know, like some people just want significance, you know, feel like, Hey, I contributed. Please recognize that I did this. You can take, you can take it. You can do what you want with it. But at the same time, like it's there. Like you can't say, and I think that's going to prevent a lot of people from copyright, like copywriting over your work because right now we have government extortionists, you know, people, people use copyright as like, if I didn't copyright my work, you know, I feel like that someone, if they valued my work enough, which I'm not saying my work is 100% valuable, but I believe in it. I believe in it. But, you know, not, it's not going to be valuable to everybody. But if someone valued it enough, they might, you know, go to government, put a copyright in, and say, hey, that's mine. I did it, you know. Right. And, then, and then say, yeah, this guy can't sell his work, you know. and, and He's got to pay me. Yeah, he's got to pay yeah. me. He's got to right. pay me royalties to sell my work that right. really was mine. So with that existing right now, I, I can't blame anybody for doing intellectual property in, in a sense, like doing copyright, I, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to, I'm honestly not going to sue anybody. All right. So it's a defensive measure. Yeah. It's yeah. a defensive measure. It's not, it's not like, Oh, I'm going to go, Hey, you, you copy my book. Like I'm going to sue you. Like, right. I think actually some of the copyright laws in the U S might actually be that if you do create a work of art or a photograph, you don't, don't have to necessarily copyright it for it to be copyrighted, but you just won't have the full extension of copyright laws of, um, protection sure something like that yeah uh there was this university of like nicosia trying to teach like bitcoin cryptocurrency lessons or classes and they give out i believe the degrees or the acknowledgement on the blockchain oh cool yeah, yeah that's really cool yeah. yeah uh and like you mentioned i think that's a great way because in the past most people would say like the only way you could ever get acknowledged for cre- so even if you created something if someone panned it first they'll get the recognition for it right yeah um, and this is something I always bring up with the Wright brothers. One of the first letters that they sent out was to the patent attorney office to kind of put <laughs> out there. But you never hear about the great, awesome, fantastical planes that they uh, will pour their lives into like they did with the uh, the first one in uh, Kitty Hawk Hills. Uh, that's because they spent the rest of their lives uh, becoming uh, intellectual in- uh, property rights uh, extortionists yeah, when but, they went around just suing people for trying to create planes in their own backyard without giving them, you know, a cent of that uh, profit. So, and this is why during World War One, when it occurred, and you had all these uh, 
planes in the, in, the, in the combat theater, the United States didn't have any. So really, yeah, I, I didn't they, know that. They, they had to pass a law to say, in the event of like some emergency, you know, we can kind <laughs> of search and Of course, yeah. emergency powers. It's amazing how those always. Th- those two also, I think they did. They would do shows, but it probably behooved them to challenge everybody else's right to fly a plane. Uh, so that they their shows would be more well attended, right? They right. Could, they could offer ticket sales and and uh, but yeah, that museum that when you see them, um, I think about it's in North Carolina. Yeah, and you only you only see the planes there, but you won't see like they're like, well, what did they do after that? No, no, no. <laughs> the history ends there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> after that, they just became IP extortionists. Like he could say like Howard Rourke and uh, the Fountainhead. Have you guys read that? No. And ran novel. She was, you know, there's a lot of people carry you to like a good uh, percentage point of like fostering and progressing uh, libertarian ideals, like property rights, great ideas. And she did a great job in doing that. And then, like, a lot of these times when you look at some of these people, like, ah, but there's some weird stuff about them, right? And her weird stuff would be that uh, she believed in IP and you couldn't change any of her ideas. So you couldn't augment them. You couldn't edit them. Uh, that's the way it is. And there's no way in changing that. And I think her fault in that was because she didn't actually define property rights uh, definitionally wise, right? She just kind of just begging the question, property rights, well, I define what are property rights. Um, so her character in the book, an architecture, uh was helping someone create design a building for this uh, agency and he says as long as you don't change anything i'll help you out but you know he changes stuff he compromises and so the building that howard work helps him to design changes and he feels like that's a betrayal of the contract between you and me so i'm going to go and destroy the building and blow it up and he does uh mm, wow right but you could say that's also ip terrorism because that's not his uh, it's physical the, the, property, right? Right, yeah. right. Those are his ideas that right. he shared, right? There's nothing in the contract that says, like, if I find you that you did this, you know, I have the right to, uh, you know, take a sledgehammer and blow it up with some dynamite. Yeah, <laughs> Stefan Kinsella is a great contributor to the Mises Institute he is. On, on this topic. And I own a copy of his uh, Against Intellectual Property signed by Stefan Kinsella. Wow, yeah. wow, that is really yeah. cool. He's yeah. a and he's a patent attorney too. So. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, no way. You yeah. serious? Well, he, he tries yeah. to stay out of patents most of these days, but yeah. I said, I was like, hey, I love your work. Um, could I mail you a copy of this book? Because I was at the Mises Institute uh, at the university. Yeah. And uh, could you sign it for me? He's like, yeah, I'll sign it for you. So yeah, it's in the uh, anarchist library now. <laughs> oh, wonderful. That's that's awesome. There's also a great uh, episode of the Tom Woods Show with him talking about um, Hans Hermann Hoppe because he's a big Hoppe fan too. And uh, if you don't know a lot about Hoppe, it just helps to... You know, have a quick like thirty or forty minute episode. To, he to maintains to. his website. Um, it, it is a decent website, still from like looking like from the nineties. But he does a good job <laughs> uh, archiving uh, the important works. Uh, yeah. And I think uh, Hapa. There's a lot of older people that just don't know how to internet. So I think that's kind of what it is. Yeah. 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 Um, boomers. <laughs> but uh, so I would say in, in, in creating a this book and your experience in it, like my personal experience in this has been through like th- through a lot as well. And uh, I would say it's kind of marked through sometimes um, painful <laughs> learning experiences yeah, yeah. as well. Uh, what would you say uh, would be like um, some painful experiences you learned or anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think that if you believe in something enough, you know, it really just comes down to looking at the fundamentals, looking at, looking ahead. Uh, because right now I think a lot of people see like, Oh, the market's down or this is down. But you know, people don't just get like, Oh, I'm just going to sell all my Apple stock because Apple's down today. Like they believe in the real product. They believe in what, what it is. Um, I believe, you know, and people, people, you know, believe in Microsoft because of the software, you know? And, Oh yeah, they are, a physical company or some people say, but at the same time, like, you know, they have, they have software. That's what they're, you know, most of it's software, you know, it's software oriented. Like, yeah, they have hardware that goes along with the software, but people pay for the software. And that's what, you know, cryptocurrency comes down to is it's a decentralized software. You know, it's available to basically anybody that's able to access the internet. And, um, 
going back go back to where we were um i i think you just gotta focus on the fundamentals i think you gotta really look at why you're in it and understand the mindset um you know be patient you know have some perseverance um you know be willing to learn new things um yeah stuff like that um i mean i thought this book really touched on the best um themes for people who are new to it and have no idea what cryptocurrency i mean it answered a lot of questions for me too you know and i'm i'm no expert on crypto but it's just one of these things you could hand to that family member who's wondering why you spend so much time in crypto or why you spend so much time talking about it and say here's here's why and um you know here's some pointers if you're thinking about getting into it absolutely yeah so in the book i mentioned you know um, like the ideal, you know, cryptocurrency or like, now there's no such thing as a perfect anything, but at the same time, like you can really find close to perfect. You can find, you know, things out there that you, you know, you, you, you feel strongly enough about where you can, um, you know, do a really, you know, say, wow, I really could follow this project. I could, I do believe in this. Um, I think, I think, so my book does tell you what I like the fundamental ideal cryptocurrency for a hodler would be, um, of course, everybody has their own opinion of that. Um, also it kind of gives you the mindset, you know, telling you how to prepare to be, to, to, to prepare for the worst. I mean, prepare for the worst times. Like even if you fully believe it and you believe it's a good investment, you know, right now I think what Bitcoin is at 3,600. Thir- yeah. 36, for- yeah. 3,648 right now. Um, you know, it was at 20,000 earlier this year it's temporary, you know, it's, it's only going to go so low. Like people believe in it and it's going to just keep going up. I mean, yeah, I, I just, yeah. I it, think, uh, I think that's right. Very true. I think, uh, in terms of like, uh, you can sacrifice in terms of, uh, patience, I think, or in terms of like expecting like where things are going to go or, uh, reputation. Like when we reached like 1200 a couple of years ago and went all the way down to $180 or something like that and you're still advocating for it uh at the in, in, in spite of the face of everyone else of course like you know who has the last laugh now right the new low is around right. 3600 yeah uh i think that's a good testament in terms of like where bitcoin's going to go i did talk to um uh i have weird conversations around richmond sometimes where people <laughs> just kind of spark out conversations yeah. talk to someone who works at the federal reserve <clears throat> really and um yeah that lunch spot and I was asking about like, what do you think about uh, inflation? Don't you think that has an effect on the U.S. dollar? Don't you think that eventually, you know, losing a lot of its value is going to go be worth next to nothing? It's like, well, you know, it's uh, I think it's unfounded. I don't think that's a, a, a real argument. I don't want to want to go into that because I just want to hear some other because I don't want to put them off. It's yeah, like, yeah. Well, technically, let's go down the list. Just yeah. go full Ron Paul. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I was say like, was he going to tell you all the Keynesian economics? Like, I just want to know like what what his frame of thought were on certain topics, right? Yeah. I wasn't really, I wasn't going to try to convince him. I just want to know. So I was like, so what do you think about Bitcoin? And he's like, well, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's been around already. You know, it's a, uh, it's a cryptocurrency. It's online. It's like, yeah. And I was like, most money's online already. It's like, yeah, that's true. Yeah. And I was like, uh, well, I think it's, uh, I think, I think it's here to stay. I don't know if government's going to create their own, but I'm for sure. Maybe not, but I think <laughs> cryptocurrency is, is here to stay. It's like, Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. That a Fed worker, he seemed like a, a senior person. He looked like like forty something. So look, he's mm. been there for a while. That he believes the Bitcoin's gonna, that you can't get rid of it. Uh, so I think that was an interesting. You have to get rid of it. The, the only say is to get rid of the internet to get rid of Bitcoin. Right. And it's kind of funny because you have someone like uh, Paul Krugman who once said that. Um, I yeah. quote here: "The growth of the internet will slow drastically as the flaw in Mikhoff's law." And so he was talking about the potential number of potential connections in a network. Uh, and so he was saying that it's going to be a fad, no more different than uh, the fax machine. And that, uh, <laughs> you know, because the uh, number of conversations you can have can only be, uh, you can only reach so many different kind of conversations you can have with someone over online. And then eventually it's just going to be uh, done out of boredom, right? You know, we already have all the conversations. So, so he, he, he thinks the the equilibrium is going to be like, oh, no internet. We don't need... We, right, we don't need it. Yeah, yeah, we already had the all the conversations. We had yeah. an ink chat already and then now it's done. But, you know, that's what government Let is. Let my you know? computer do it for me. I don't, need right, to do, right. I don't need to talk on the internet. I know there's a lot of people who will eventually just decide to check out of the internet and sure. social media. But I think the vast majority of people in the world are just 
like this thing. They like being a node on this on the system. But it's not just even if you check out everything you use is checked in. So yeah. <laughs> in terms of like uh, the internet's brought in like uh, ways for you to to have access online payments, right? To buy things online, right? So even if you don't have a Facebook, you're going to buy stuff online, they, right? They you're gonna, it's a tool. Right, you're going to if you want a business, you need to be online. Yeah. Uh even if um there's even like smart devices in your house it has to be online. Uh, so there's different, uh, if, if you go to, uh, nobody uses rotary phones anymore, right? You, you have to have a cell phone, right? That's yeah. going to have uh, online web access to it. I like the, the videos where they try to show like middle, like younger millennials. I don't know if like people born in 1999 counts as millennials uh, or, or <laughs> 90s kids, I mean to say, but like they're, they're on the rotary phone, like they don't even know how it works. Like trying to yeah. put their finger on it, it's like they don't know you have to take the phone off and put it on there. So they have no idea how these sort of things work. But I think that's pretty much how government functions with a lot of technology that the market, they're always playing catch up games. Yeah, people again like John McCain had no idea how to use the email. He had people email for for him, for him <laughs> right? So you have dinosaurs, very old, extinct people. In terms of like they should have been you know gone long ago, but in the prop uh, uphold through for whatever reason. But these people don't again. Government doesn't create anything, so they're always just adopting whatever the market creates. And so I would believe in the long term of things, Bitcoin has shown a good history of a positive sense of of growth. Of uh, not just in value, but in terms of uh, market adoption rates, uh, ATMs everywhere. Now there's two here in Richmond, or three. Yeah. It's it's funny. You're seeing more and more congressmen come out and be like, "Yeah, I own Bitcoin." It's like, right? It, yeah. It, was it three now or four? Like that actually admit? Didn't to, you accept Bitcoin for your campaign? Yeah, yeah, actually, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I did actually. Um, it's like sports betting. You know, sports betting is becoming more and more popular. Everybody's doing it. Suddenly people are much more sympathetic to be, it being legal. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, exactly. And it was always designed to be an underground currency to begin with. So the more yeah. attention it draws to itself, the government puts it out there. It's like, because there's no Bitcoin bank to stop or control, right? Since everything's already online, you can't stop people from not going online. Uh, no more than you can stop from anyone from print, printing guns in their bathtubs or bump stocks. Sounds like rat poison squared. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that's what Jimmy Buffett called it or whatever, Bitcoin. It's but like, don't you yeah, think with with uh, these old timers trying to regulate this, they can't keep up, um, and yet they won't go quietly into that good night. They won't say, I'm, I'm just going to let this happen, um, even though we had a good run with the dollar and we had a good run at controlling – you know, inflating it and and destroying its purchasing power to our benefit. Um, we'll just we're just going to let Bitcoin have have the day. You know, are they ever going to do that? No, it's going to be a fight. Unless unless they decide to buy it all, <laughs> or buy most of it well, to, on, to have a good control over it. You know, right. they're on their deathbed right now, right? What are they like? What's the average age of a boomer? Like seventy five, eighty, or something? No, right? I think it's a little. 60s. I think it's. I think it's yeah. a little lower. Is it Because it, really? it's a really huh. wide. Gener- it's a really People's wide generation. The ones that brought in all the horrible ideas to us. Yeah. <laughs> well, did you see the Google uh, hearing or whatever? The, like, I think, like a couple months ago, like they they had like a whole video of, like all these questions that these congressmen were asking, or and they were like. What is this? What is this internet thing? And you're like, right? Yeah, yeah. it's like, uh, like, how? I, like, do you not use a cell phone? Like, do you not right. use like the most common? Like, do you not use Google? Period. These, these like, people feel like they're the ones that we really need. Like, I don't know. I think about Logan Run. It's like you guys are like past your age. Just you know, you guys are holding yeah. us back. The oldest baby boomers would be seventy one or seventy two. Seventy one, seventy two. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, we still have a little ways, <laughs> right? I mean, again, again, they're the most uh, coddled, uh, rich, and wealthiest generation of human beings that have ever existed on this planet, and they've used us as their collateral to have fund uh, that paradise for themselves, right? And uh, with no like looking forward to the future or anything like that. Now, I think what Bitcoin does is d- does grant people to have high type preference yeah uh in terms of saving and i understand what sacrifices and patience yeah and those are the kind of qualities that you need to have like a successful and prosperous society yeah um i will say that uh bitcoin is uh what, what, there's a funny meme out there that says like hey it's uh it's pretty cool that you know whatever bitcoin has done has definitely brought a lot of people to understand austrian economics 
uh, and a sign of trying to order things yeah. online. Yeah, the uh, Mises Caucus in the Libertarian Party is is the one that's tried to introduce a lot of topics about um, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and trying to get that as a you know a plank in the platform or or whatever. But uh, it seems like that's become if you're into Bitcoin, you're immediately sympathetic to Austrian economics and uh, and anarcho capitalism, and it's just a good stepping stone for a lot of people. So in a way, you can you can kind of use people's greed to say here you go, here's some Bitcoin. And by the way, like the reason this is a good idea is X, Y, Z. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's great that you write a book about this. Uh, I yeah. think it's a great way to kind of introduce this to a lot of people. Again, it's very familiar for me in my introduction and my experience as well. Uh, I think you're, you're doing great, Carl. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. I've, I've definitely come a long way. Um, yeah. You know, oh, I realize. No, I love the sweater. Oh yeah, <laughs> for y'all. Hold. Hoddle, 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 hoddle. I say hoddle, but yeah, um, yeah. It comes down to you know, when I first, when I first, I realized like I've lost, I've lost weight. You know, I've, I've done a lot for myself. Um, I think it all comes down to like sacrifice and, you know, what, what is investing? Most people ask, and it's just a sacrifice. It's willing to put. Um, you know, something in now, you know, sacrifice something now for a future gain. And that's something like that humans, um, you know, that's what makes us more advanced than, you know, than most animals, you know, or most anything, you know, they say like, even the, our closest primate, you know, the chimpanzee can't do that efficiently or they can't, they can't process that. They can't decide Hey, I'm going to invest this now so I can, you know, I'm going to save my bananas in a freezer. Like they can't do that. So, you know, it's, it's funny. Jordan Pearson actually talks about how to, um, I, and I'm not really sure how it comes up, like how, why they would try to catch a chimpanzee, but he talks about how would someone catch a chimpanzee? Cause they're really strong animals. They're fast. You know, it's really hard to escape them. And, you know, and what, and basically the way you catch them is you put, you find a jar that's just big enough to get their hand in there and they can, and, but, but except they big enough so they can get their hand in, but they can't get it out. And you put some bait inside. So when you put the bait in, they stick your hand in and they get stuck and they just focus on the jar and they can't get their hand out. And they won't let go of the, yeah, they can't won't let go of the bait because they can't, they have so much instant gratification that they have to have it now. And they can't realize like, Hey, you know what? Maybe I can find something. Maybe I can find a tool to, you know, or make time to make a tool, invest some time to make a tool, um, to get that out of the jar, you know, a easier way than try to, you know, when I have it in my hand, I can't get my hand out. But if I put my hand in there, I can, you know, I can take it out without, if I let go of the bait, but if I put my hand in there and close a fist, I can't get, the, I can't get my hand mm. out. So they won't let go of the bait. And apparently like that's a big thing between humans and chimpanzees is the fact that they can actually, um, you know, we can, we can sacrifice. That's what makes us like being able to further advance society. You know, we can think ahead in the future. Yeah. We yeah. can think ahead. Yeah. They're thinking like, Oh fuck. <laughs> I'm all, this, uh, if I let go, it's gone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's my food. <laughs> right. It goes back to that concept of time preference where, you know, your ability to sacrifice of the future, almost you, you gain more humanity as you sacrifice for longer and longer periods, you know? Yeah. And it's fun. And it's funny. Like I, I think socialism and, and a lot of other things really deter people from like taking risks or, you know, like, Hey, don't, you know, be very like, wear a helmet while you, you know, like wear a helmet while you walk down the street. Like that's soon, that's where we're going. Like you right. can't like, you can't, Make sure you wear your elbow pads. You might fall. Like someone might push you. So just in case someone pushes you, make sure you have your elbow pads on. Like what are they? Like the APA just came <laughs> out to say that it's uh, wrong for boys to learn uh, traits of adventure and risk and danger. You yeah, know? yeah. And without these things, we have never like uh, gone to like the North Pole or like or go out there to, uh, to discover new lands or the Vikings to go to uh, Greenland. <laughs> call it greenland but it's ice right. but yeah to, to go out of their their comfort zone and to uh experience new things yeah exactly um you know that's why i talk about my book like you know do you think about the, the caveman like did they just like oh fire fire's too hot right i got burned i'm never touching fire again no they kept at it they kept you know they 
persevered and they said, no, I'm going to make this my light. I'm going to make this basically my bitch. Like that's what they, they yeah. that's basically what they did. Like they just like, yeah, they owned it. Like they owned it. And that's, and that's what investing is, is, is figuring out like you might, you, and, and the more research you do, the more time you invest or sacrifice to put, you know, into it, the, the more you're going to get out of it. Like you, the, you're not going to make a bad decision. You're not going to, I mean, I don't suggest anybody just like, um, I, I think people should, you know, could, they could dive in, but at the same time, like, you know, it's always good to just t- test the words with a little rather than a lot. Like I want to throw, you know, a million dollars on something. I don't know. I, I don't know what it is. You know, I, I would at least, I may throw a couple, you know, a little bit and then say, all right, I kind of like it. I know what it is. I'm going to keep going further. I'm going to yeah. keep slowly pursuing it or, you know, and, and, and that's where I think in my book, I think I actually, I actually, I'm out I'm kind of opposite in my book. I think that you should really invest and really understand what you're investing in. That's the proper way to do it is just invest. Like, I mean, research, 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 and then say, all right, I made an educated decision. I'm willing to throw all of it in. Maybe I won't. You got to figure out your risk tolerance. But I realize, you know, cryptocurrency made me a, um, you know, gave me a stronger stomach. Like it, it was able to help me get a better risk tolerance, tolerance and able to pursue other things in the world, such as like my health and such as, um, you know, being able to go out of my uh, comfort zone more. And, and so like that, Eighteen dollars I originally put into cryptocurrency, like that's what that that really began it. Like it just made me risk more, and so I, I really hope people will you know do some sacrifices or you know in other words investing in in themselves. Yeah, which in turn could, this could be the start. And I'm hoping that you know by reading this book, you know you can find that. I, it's amazing the uh, you know the talk about unemployment. They'll often talk about and they'll talk about. Um, well, is ever does everyone have a job? And ideally, the goal would not to be having a job, yeah. not to have to work. Yeah. And so you look at at this, or you look at investments, and you think this is the way out of that, and that's the way I would rather, you know, ultimately. And and you know, some people would call it retirement or whatever, but it's it's ultimately the way you'd like to. <laughs> absolutely, you know? yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's I think I think most people do want to just be able to do what they want with their lives and. And why work harder when you can work smarter? You know, hey, I'm gonna do some research now to hopefully help help myself get bigger gains in the future so I don't have to work as hard. And I can, you know, enjoy my family and I can, you know, do whatever you want. I mean, that's that's the goal. It's for the goal's freedom. I mean, right. that's you know, and and one of those aspects is financially. I mean, the another aspect is health. Like some sometimes health limits you, but that's that's a whole other topic. But at the same time, like you gotta figure out what limits you in life, and 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 basically break those barriers. You know, that's that's and that's what I think my book is really about is just being willing to sacrifice, and go go to new go to new try new risks, but also be mindful of the risks and 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 know what you're getting yourself into. But also, I learned about it, and now I'm gonna do it. That's fantastic, dude. I'm glad you wrote that book. Yeah, uh, becoming the hotler. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah, that's great. Uh, kudos to your friend. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. To it. Uh, I will say, uh, where, is there any where else where, where people can find your book information? Yeah. Um, so it's called, uh, becoming the hodler.com. It's no spaces, obviously. Um, yeah. Becoming the hodler.com. That's, that's where you'd find it. It, it, it redirects you to the Amazon, um, site where you can buy the book. Great. Uh, I encourage those listening, watching, yeah. or, uh, to check into that. Thank you. Yeah, a, absolutely. I hope, I hope, I hope you guys enjoy. And, uh, great with that. Stay liberated. Well, I, oh, I got one more. Oh, thing. yeah. One more sorry. Thing. Sorry. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't mean to interrupt. I got one more thing. So, um, you know, just for you, Cal and John, I, I, um, I found Lysander Spooner's new, um, well, I shouldn't say new, the recently found two trees is, on competitive currency and banking and only one nonprofit has it right now. I'm not sure how they found it, but it basically combats, um, socialism. And I'm hoping that I would like to really get this out to the public. So I'm hoping I talked to Cal and John before, and they said they'd be, you know, willing to, um, you know, put some effort into what's the title of the book. 
uh, two treatises on competitive currency and banking by Lance Sanders Spooner. Yeah, I heard it's that, like it's something some new works that this recently discovered. Yeah, recently yeah. discovered. Um, so I'm hoping they'll they'll you know they'll do an audio book, and it takes a lot of time and effort to do that. So you know if if y'all would be you know willing to just you know Patreon on them and just because I know it's going to take some time and effort, and I think they told me they would you know by me giving them this they'll put it out there for everybody to hear because we wanted to go to as many people as possible. So um, yeah, please you know. Give them Patreon. I, I mean, they're not. They're not saying this. I'm saying this because I, I think they deserve it because they're putting in the work and, you know, it takes time to do it. And there's a lot of editing that comes into, uh, you know, writing, um, speaking an audio book and stuff. So, yeah, I really appreciate that. That's pretty cool. I think every anarchist would make the, uh, the pilgrimage to Liz Anner Spooner's uh, grave to marker. It's outside of uh, Boston. Um, I found the location. I went there uh, a year and a half ago. Two summers ago, yeah, and uh, somebody actually just put money because it used to be just like a, just a tab, a slate on the ground, but put an obelisk monument and with his face on it. Oh, and that's so cool! Inscribed uh, "Champion of Liberty" on there. Hmm. And I think that's uh, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Yeah, uh, I'll put a liberate patch there. I left it behind, but. I yeah, think I definitely a, have to. We have to. We have, we should make a. Um, uh, yeah, we, we will. I think a, a, a great field trip for us to do. Just yeah. get out there, spend a whole day, just drive up there, have some oh, fun absolutely. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We should probably bring some drinks and, and cheers him. You know, cheers his grave. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, thanks. Really appreciate that, man. Thanks hey. for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. And with that, uh, those listening, stay liberated. Stay off our property. <laughs> I don't have a tagline. <laughs> That's great.